On Monday, March 24, 1919, five ardent forces of Detroit met in a downtown office and organized within a period of two hours what is now known as the Women Lawyers Association of Michigan. First president of WLAM, Teresa Doland. Lawyers Association of Michigan annual meeting in June of 1951, former President Ann Davidow read a report written by Henrietta Rosenthal, WLAM's president from 1921 to 1923, outlining why the organization was formed. The organization was formed to advance the interest of women members of the legal profession and women about to enter the profession and to strengthen professional ties. Women lawyers were few in number and lacked a clearinghouse for their problems. As an associated group, it was felt they should exchange ideas and give each other the benefit of individual experience with the goal of attaining a high standard of legal practice and earning the respect of the bench and bar. It's important to know that this organization started before we even had the right to vote because change happens after People come together and they recognize that there is a need for change and feeling a little bit uncomfortable and pushing the envelope. And that's what the first five women of this organization did. I think I see it all as a movement. So, you know, the, the idea that women were asking for the vote in the 1800s, really with some earnestness in the mid-1800s, and then culminating in being able to take the bar and be members of the profession, of the legal profession, but then to get the vote shortly thereafter, I think that's all in a movement. And you couldn't have really one without the other. You needed to have um, lawyers, for instance, who could um, take cases to court, um, exclusion cases, because there wasn't really a body of uh, discrimination cases or discrimination law at that time. You also had to have women who could vote for other women or men who were in sympathy with the, the issues that were important to them. I think they probably wanted to help each other, which was a big part of what we were trying to do as well, by referring business to each other, by promoting each other for positions, by um, all the things that we've done to sort of help the sisters, um, I'm sure they were doing that too, maybe just on a smaller scale. Pioneers, courage, tenacity. I mean, try to picture it. Try to picture being a woman in the early 1900s where everything was run by men. Every single thing. And they had the voice, the courage to stand up. I think that the women certainly drew support from each other and um, from the old records I've seen, and there are a number of them, it was, a, it was a fun time. I mean, they weren't like hanging around being sad that they didn't have the right to vote. They were working on things and, and trying to make things better for themselves and for others. One of those people was Ann Davidow, former WLAM president. She was a suffragist who campaigned for women's right to vote by speaking from soapboxes at factory gates. While working to help her family and to put her brother through law school, she was once fired for wearing a suffragist button to work. So when you say you've come a long way, baby, you think back on the history of women lawyers, and it was like fighting for the right to vote. Um, it was like women that were so dedicated that were really the ones that plowed the path for us today. And going back over my speech that I made uh, to the women at the annual meeting of the Women Lawyer Association, this was at the Detroit Club, May 25th, 1995. Our founding sister said, the purpose of the association shall be to secure the rights of women in society and advance the interests of women members of the legal profession, to promote equality and social justice for all people, to improve relations between legal profession and the public, and encourage the continued legal education of, of lawyers. 
That mission has been carried forward decade after decade by the determined leadership and membership of this organization. What began in the metropolitan Detroit area has now expanded into seven active regions around the state. If there were only a state organization, people couldn't get together. Michigan's a huge state, and, and the logistics of having meetings or, or forging relationships just wouldn't make that possible without the regions. Well, we always looked at Detroit as being like the big area for Women Lawyers Association, but the Western region was always very, very important. We loved it because we were in our area, our location, and we brought people from the lake area. We brought people from Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo. The Western region just had a, a real homey feel to it in terms of having a good group of women attorneys who wanted that connection and not have to drive you know, two and a half, three hours to do every meeting. So it really was important and it's really fit a need that was great. Since those early years, the membership numbers have continued to grow. As WLAM celebrates its 100th year anniversary, over 600 women lawyers have joined, and it's still growing. The women lawyers used to hold, and still today, hold uh, booths at the swearing-in ceremonies for attorneys. And so right during the, at the very end of the presentation, there was uh, a group of women lawyers from the Women Lawyers Association of Michigan standing there, and they were taking membership applications. And I thought, what better way than to join this organization first after being sworn in as an attorney, uh, to be able to work with and collaborate with other women on new issues as a young attorney joining the profession for the first time. Back in the mid-80s when I got here, there were relatively few women lawyers. There were very few women lawyers who practiced in litigation. And there were very few ways to get to meet other women lawyers other than as opposing counsel. So WLAM helped me meet other women in town, make friends, network. It was always important, kind of as a safe place to go for a reality check. If you were having trouble with something to get advice, they were safe people to admit. Maybe something wasn't going as well as you would want it to. Um, some of my friends, some of my best friends now are people I met at WLAM 35 years ago. The current mission is to advance the interest of women members of the legal profession, promote improvements in the administration of justice, and promote equality and social justice for all people. There have been so many pivotal and important moments in the last 100 years. In 1919, the same year the Women Lawyers Association of Michigan was formed, Congress passed the 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote. But in many states, women still could not serve on juries, hold office, own a business, or sign a contract without their husband's permission. Then, in 1922, the Detroit College of Law Trustees decided to stop admitting women. Ms. Teresa Dolan voiced the stand taken by WLAM that if women are to be excluded, then it is for no other reason than because they are women. Before the war, women were barred, but when the war depleted the student body to such an extent, they began to accept women again until this recent declaration. The excuse given by the college was that there are no facilities for taking care of women students, but the only facilities needed are classrooms and enough chairs for the students to sit in. One of the women whose application to the Detroit College of Law from which her older brother had graduated had been turned down on the basis of sex was Ann R. Davidal, president from 1925 to 1927, and a pioneer for women attorneys. She graduated from the University of Detroit Law School and passed her bar examination in 1920. She then went before the U.S. Supreme Court to present the case involving Michigan barmaids fighting for civil rights against a 1945 Michigan law that banned female bartending in cities with populations of over 50,000, unless their husband or father owned the bar. Davidow made the argument to the U.S. Supreme Court that sex discrimination violated women's constitutional rights by denying them equal protection and treatment under the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. 
The barmaids lost, although after continuous fighting, the Michigan State Legislature overturned the law shortly thereafter. The youngest and first woman to be elected as Justice of the Peace in Michigan in 1931 was the Honorable Lila Neuenfeld. Ten years later, in 1941, she was the youngest woman lawyer in the United States, elected to circuit court, and the press headline read, Justice Dawns a Skirt. When members of the press agreed with her, they referred to her womanly wisdom. And when they didn't, they wondered how a woman could be so illogical at times and so completely to the point at others. A redhead who dressed fashionably, she made her mark as a masterful judge and helped women gain ground in their emergence into politics. They made a big deal about the fact that she had a skirt and could make a decision in a courtroom. Like somehow your apparel would cause you not to be as intellectually astute. And I just see them as pioneers, um, m much like the Martin Luther Kings and the Civil Rights Movement. I mean, the, these women were fighting against all odds times a billion, and they paved the way to have a woman like me, now 28 years a judge, be able to say, you know, thank you. Phoebe Munecki was president from 1938 to 1939. She was jailed for freedom. The plan of the suffragist was to keep a fire burning on the pavement in front of the White House until the Susan B. Anthony Amendment was passed. Whenever the president made a speech in Europe for democracy, the speech was burned in the watch fire, and a bell, which was over the door of the headquarters, would toll. Phoebe was one of the women who burned the speeches on liberty given by President Wilson upon reaching Italy. After burning the second speech, they were arrested, sent to the House of Detention, and charged with breaking a federal park regulation. When they got to court, they were charged with building a bonfire on a public highway between sunset and sunrise. Three went to prison for five days and three for 10 days. They all went on a hunger strike. In 1941, Lila Neuenfeld, WLAM president from 1931 to 1933, was the first female elected judge to the circuit court in Michigan. WLAM continues to offer the leadership experience and endorsement that allows women to advance into judicial roles. I think one of the important functions that Women Lawyers does is that judicial endorsement and ratings. They do take the time to have the interviews with the candidates, really do a good background check and then rank them for the public. And a big focus of, of my involvement in Women Lawyers was our candidate endorsement committee. And we had in, in virtually every county pretty much had um, a, a committee which basically would endorse folks for a judicial position. And our opinions really mattered to people. People really looked at what, who the women lawyers were endorsing and why. And we, we did not only support women, we supported men as well. And so there we had a questionnaire about their position on various issues, not issues that would be decided on the bench, but in general. The organization was enormously helpful to me in my career. As I look back on it, I believe that for one thing, advancing in the organization, both the Women's Bar and the Women Lawyers Association, uh, helped me uh, gain the self-confidence to run as a judge. Uh, also some administrative experience in, in, in administering the organizations. Um, it gave me some um, credibility with the public because when I did run then from Court of Appeals in 1988, I could run as president of the Women Lawyers Association. And I thought it was pretty clear to me that um, those who were, were evaluating my candidacy uh, tended to be favorably impressed with those credentials. So I think it helped me advance, it helped me be elected a judge. In 1942, during the Silver Jubilee celebration at Stouffer's on Woodward Avenue, the Women Lawyers Association reported that its members sold $144,000 worth of war bonds, which is equivalent to over $2 million by today's standard. In a newspaper article, one reporter wrote, 
We didn't learn whether the Women Lawyers Association used the art of persuasion, coercion, or out-and-out silver oratory in their highly successful campaign. The first Hispanic president of WLAM was Dorothy Comstock in 1957. In 1976, she was the first woman to serve on the Michigan Court of Appeals, and then the first Hispanic woman to be elected to the Supreme Court of any state. She was the founder and honorary chair of the Michigan Supreme Court Historical Society, inducted into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame, and won the State Bar of Michigan Distinguished Public Service Award. Then in 1970, in an answer to a query from Detroit attorney Sue Weisenfeld, who stated that she wears trouser suits to the office and felt it ridiculous to have to change to a dress before she went to court, but did not wish to risk affecting her clients' cases, Michigan Supreme Court Chief Justice Thomas E. Brennan confirmed that female attorneys can wear pants in court. I find nothing inappropriate about trouser suits for women lawyers appearing in the Supreme Court or any other court in the state. They have achieved wide acceptance among women of good taste in both business and social circles, and would not in these times be looked upon as mere sportswear. We used to dress like the men. We used to wear little pinstripe suits, and they had to be skirts and, and little bow ties. And the, the significant thing that I watched over the years was that women dressed professionally, but the way they wanted to with color, with, with style, the kind of thing that, it's a funny thing to point out, but that meant that women were taken for who they were and not what they looked like, and either way, they just brought their brains to the game and, and that's what they were judged on. The first Armenian-American-born president of WLAM was inducted in 1971. Gladys Barsamian was also the first woman elected to the Wayne County Juvenile Division. She served in probate court from 1975 to 1993 and was the founding member of the International Women's Forum of Michigan. The first female Michigan Supreme Court Justice, Mary Stallings Coleman, had a seat on the bench in 1972. WLAM now gives out the Mary S. Coleman Award to members in recognition of significant contributions as a judiciary role model for women in the legal profession and in society. In 1973, Judge Teresa Doss was elected the first African-American president. Back in 61 and early 60s, there were very, very few women in law school. When I graduated, there was about five women in the whole law school, and it was three in my class. This is at Ohio State, a state university, only three women. And the professor gave you a hard time, too. You should go home. You should be at home taking care of your kids. Why are you here? A man could have your seat. I mean, you can't believe that those things went on, but it did. About 71 to 72, things were changing. There were a lot more women going to law school. It was, everything was just changing. It was just, it was just a beautiful time for, for uh, to be a woman and be in the legal profession. Back in when I became president, the women that surrounded me, we were out to change the social order. We were pushing on all fronts. You know, we were pushing in the law school and in the law firms and, and mediation and just every place that we could so women could uh, fulfill their dreams. Beverly Clark became the first Native American president in 1978. Her law practice focused on family law in the Detroit area. Beverly made history when she became the first Native American on the commission following her appointment by Governor William Milliken. Prior to her appointment, she had been active in several legal and Native American organizations, including the board of directors for Michigan Indian Legal Services. I think that it would be important to continue to try to work towards a diverse board, a diverse organization, and I decided that um, for my inauguration that I wanted it to be held on trust property. So we held it at the Soaring Eagle Casino Resort in the reservation of the Saginaw Chippewa Indians. The reason that I did that is I wanted to also incorporate a cultural immersion to introduce a lot of our members to Indian culture because we have such a large population of Native people here in Michigan. And I thought it would be really great because we have always had in our culture a balance between men and women and I wanted them to see that. 
And remember past President Justice Mary Stallings Coleman? In 1979, she was named the first female Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court. A very significant and important event occurred within the association in 1983. The Women Lawyers Association of Michigan Foundation was created to support women in the pursuit of their legal career. After about eight years into the foundation's existence, former WLAM President Dawn Van Hoke transitioned into becoming the president of the foundation. We decided that we would focus on education of women. And I think that was really a turning point for the foundation. The foundation was reorganized to support women in their educational pursuits and also to recognize them for their um, accomplishments. And we made very clear from the very beginning that one of the criteria for getting money from the foundation, i.e. a scholarship, is that you have to have demonstrated some leadership on behalf of women in society. And so uh, that stuck. It's still the criteria. And um, as a result, we have some very unbelievably accomplished law students who get this award every year. So as we got started, we realized we had to be more effective fundraisers. Between then, 20 years ago, and now, we've given away a half a million dollars in scholarships to um, women law students. Each year, WLAM presents the Jean L. King Leadership Award and the Mary S. Coleman Award. The former is presented to a deserving WLAM member, and the latter is awarded to a judiciary role model. Jean King, icon of the movement, a feminist to the core. Um, we all looked up to her tremendously, and uh, she was just feisty as all get out. Um, what I loved about receiving the Jean King Award, which was unexpected, it was the most wonderful surprise, um, was that uh, the wording of the award just thrilled me. It was for um, fearless advocacy in the face of adversity. And I thought, you know, that really summed up so much about a 40-year career. I was like jumping up and down. I was so excited because this is a this is a big deal. And it's a statewide award. And I felt flattered immediately. I thought, well, you know, there's probably a zillion other people that deserve it more than I do. But I was so excited. And, and, it, and it made me think of this is in the name of a woman who did so much. So you better keep working, Sarah, because you, you've got a lot to go. We're, we're walking in the footsteps of women like Jean King. Prior to 1986, women were not allowed to be members of certain social clubs, such as the Detroit Athletic Club. WLAM joined a coalition to support passage of a city of Detroit ordinance, requiring these clubs to allow women members. I knew some of the women who were involved in in trying to break down those barriers. I think Carol Champ was one of them, Pam Harwood, some other people, Bev Clark probably, but people who were uh, who saw those places of business. That's where that's what it was all about is how are you supposed to entertain clients? How are you supposed to do business if you can't get into uh, the places where it's being done. It was, you know, similar to what happened with golf courses and golf clubs, that type of thing. Also, in 1986, Julia Donovan Darlow, WLAM president from 1977 to 1978, became the first female president of the State Bar of Michigan. Fighting for women's rights and equality has always been in the forefront of the association. WLAM supported the effort to create a reasonable woman standard for deciding if sexual harassment had occurred. But in 1993, the Michigan Supreme Court rejected the reasonable woman standard. I think that the uh, Women Lawyers Association in the early 90s um, took a stance uh, supporting that, um, and our Supreme Court has never adopted that. But, you know, you think about, it's always been like a reasonable man standard. And I mean, just like, okay, it's 2018, can we say reasonable person? Because we're all different. We're all different. And uh, we see things differently. In 1994, WLAM joined seven other organizations intervening in the Miranda Ireland custody case. There, the trial court judge ruled that Miranda's father should have custody because his mother was a homemaker and Miranda's mother, a college student, planned to put her in daycare. 
One of the things that I was very privileged to be able to do was to be a co-author of a brief to the Michigan Supreme Court in a case called Ireland versus Smith which was the case where the Supreme Court decided that working women who put their children in childcare were not less good parents than the fathers of those children who left the baby home with grandma. That daycare wasn't worse than family for the best interest of children. And that was a very important decision for family law attorneys in the state of Michigan and for the members of WLAM, many of whom have to use childcare when they're having their children. In 2006, Judge Charlene Mecklen Elder's appointment to the Wayne County Circuit Court bench was widely believed to be the first appointment of a Muslim female to a judgeship in the United States. In 2007, WLAM filed a brief in the Michigan Supreme Court challenging the denial of benefits to same-sex domestic partners by public institutions. Then in 2014, WLAM joined with other associations in filing an amicus brief with the U.S. Supreme Court in support of marriage equality. I love the Women Lawyers Associations of Michigan because they're very, you know, diverse and inclusive. They're so inclusive. And uh, that's big too. Um, I, I happen to be um, married to a woman. And uh, I had a lot of women lawyers that supported me in that when it's not always so popular to be able to say it. And here I am saying it. In 2016, WLAM had its first Arab American woman as president. I thought that it was important to um, highlight that and it, during my um, term as before my swearing in as president, I had a reception held at the Arab American National Museum to help uh, showcase and highlight the diversity and also to help bring it home with the mission of what our organization does. And so bringing it full circle, um, having the women um, that I hold dearly attending this reception and learning about that history helped. One of the new accomplishments that our organization has also been working on is uh, the lactation for uh, mothers who are attorneys as well and who don't have a space in, in, uh, in the courtrooms. So fortunately, we had some courts um, some reserved lactation rooms for women as well. With so much accomplished in the past 100 years, what does the next 100 years hold for this organization? According to 2018 WLAM President Julie Gafke in her article titled, The Future of Women in Law, there are still hills to climb and issues to address within the legal profession. Yes, our mission includes advancing the interest of women members of our legal profession, but that is not our sole purpose now nor moving into the future. There are human rights issues that disproportionately affect women. Our organization, aligned with other organizations, can help to make positive change toward eliminating human rights atrocities. We must continue to use our voices to promote improvements in the administration of justice, as well as equality and social justice for all people. century, we have a story to tell about where we've been and where we're going. So I think uh, it's, it's really significant. The number of um, women equity partners in firms, the number of women on boards of companies, the number of chief legal counsel and general counsel of companies, yes, it's improving. It's improving vastly, but it certainly isn't where it should be. It's important to have men at the table and as part of the conversation so that we can work together to further our, our mission. We met the challenge of our founders and I challenge women today to do the same thing. I had a place to turn, an organization of others who I could commune with and uh, exchange information. It has just been a fundamental part of my life to have the relationships that started all those years ago. I think a just society means a voice for 
every population, women, men, people of color, people of all religions. That is where I think that women lawyers can have such a great impact. Let's do what's right. Let's have equality. That's why it's important to have the Women Lawyers Association of Michigan for another 100 years.